So welcome everyone to this revolutionary Shelley Roundtable. And thank you for joining us to celebrate Percy Bysshe Shelley's 229th birthday with our distinguished lineup of speakers, Julie Camarda, Graham Henderson, Jacqueline Mulholland, and Michael Scrivener. This is the second online event in our Shelley 200 series leading up to next year's Shelley Conference in London. I'm Amanda Blake Davis and I'll be chairing this event along with our lead conference organizer, Emma Mercer. We're also very grateful to our fellow organizers, Bish Coffee and Paul Stevens, to our conference advisory board, Will Bowers, Madeline Callahan, Calvin Everest and Sharon Rustin, and to our postgraduate helpers, Laura Blunston and Anna Stevenson. Please do visit our website, theshellyconference.com, for details of future events and conference updates. We ask that you please keep your microphones muted during this event, but you're welcome to use the chat box at all times. We'll begin this roundtable with an opening question for all of our speakers, followed by an individual question for each of them. And after this, we'll have a roundtable discussion until around 8 p.m. British summer time. We'll then take a five minute break and we encourage you to type any questions for our speakers into the chat box during this break. Our speaker, speakers will answer your questions until around 25 minutes past, and this event will end promptly at 8.30 p.m. British Summer Time. And this event is being recorded and will be uploaded to our YouTube channel. So I'd like to begin by welcoming and introducing our fantastic lineup, lineup of speakers. And thanks again to you all for joining us this evening. So Julie Camarda is an assistant teaching professor in the Rutgers University English Department Writing Program. Her current research centers on the interrelationship between poetic form, nonverbal communication, and gendered embodiment. Her most recent essays on this and other topics have appeared in ELH, the Wordsworth Circle, and the Keats Shelley Journal. And her book length project is provisionally titled Responsive Media, Conversational Poetics in the British Romantic Period. Graham Henderson is former president and CEO of Music Canada and now serves as CEO of the London Chamber of Commerce. Graham is a self-described lifelong student of Percy Bysshe Shelley. He graduated from the University of Guelph with a double major in English literature and fine art history. And he completed a master's degree at the University of Toronto with the late Milton Wilson on Prometheus Unbound and the Problem of Opposites. Graham also serves on the board of the Keats Shelley Association of America. Jacqueline Mulholland is a writer and actress. Her plays Sylvia and Rebels and Friends toured England and Ireland in the 1990s with great success and were revived in 2015 and 2019 respectively to sell out to new audiences. She's had a lifelong love of Shelley's poetry and she completed a PhD with Professor Nora Crook at Anglia Ruskin University, published as The Theater of Shelley with Open Books in 2010, followed by her most recent monograph, Percy Bysshe Shelley, Poet and Revolutionary, published by Pluto Press in 2015. She hopes that her play, Image of Life, about Shelley, will be performed next year to mark the bicentenary of his death. We have an exclusive discount for Jacqueline's latest book, using the code SHELLY200 on the Pluto Books website. Um, Anna will paste this into the chat for you all as well. And last but not least, our um, final speaker is Michael Scrivener. Michael Scrivener is Distinguished Professor of English at Wayne State University, where he specializes in 18th and 19th century British literature and culture, with emphasis on Romanticism and Jewish studies. Michael is the recipient of a Keats Shelley Association of America Distinguished Scholar Award, and he is the author of numerous publications, including his most recent monograph, Jewish Representations in British Literature, 1780 to 1840 after Shylock, published with Palgrave Macmillan in 2011, and Radical Shelley, The Philosophical Anarchism and Utopian Thought of Percy Bysshe Shelley, published with Princeton University Press in 1982. Michael is currently working on a book length study provisionally titled John Jew King and His Circle, Radicalism, Romanticism and Anglo Jewry in Georgian England. Welcome all and thank you so much for joining us here. So we'd like to begin this discussion with an opening question for all of you. Shelley was a radical figure during his lifetime and nearly 200 years after his death, he remains revolutionary. 
In particular, lines from the mask of anarchy continue to be recited and etched onto walls and pavements during moments of global uprising and revolution. From the Tiananmen Square protests of 1989 to the Egyptian revolution in 2011, how and why does Shelley remain such a powerful and international revolutionary voice? Who wants to go first? <laughs> I don't, why don't you? Yeah, go ahead, Julie. Sorry, I think- All that, right, I, should, I, should, I knew that if I broke the silence, then uh, I'd be on the hook, so. Um, I mean, I, I think I think Graham has a lot, probably a lot to say about this as well. Um, I think in terms of why, it's interesting that you brought up the etching on walls and so forth, is that Shelley has a tremendous capacity um, for all of his figural gymnastics and his difficulty for producing notable quotables. Uh, we we mm -hmm. see rise like, you know, rise like lines from the slumber, et cetera, that seem to have a broad applicability. And for me, I think that what makes him particularly revolutionary is that for however uh, committed he is to idealism, which I think he is, and he definitely, at least for me, has one of the most consistent programmatic um, elements to a lot of his political or utopian or free love type thoughts, his more, uh, his atheism, et cetera, uh, which we can debate later, I imagine. Um, but at the same time, the notion of the poet is so fascinating because it reflects the spirit of the age as best as it is able. At the same time, I, it's not quite reflective because to be overly reflective, to fold in on oneself as the poet, uh, would be to close down one's occupation of the present. And so you get an excellent way of effectively having a poet that's extraordinarily attentive to history, extraordinarily attentive to circumstance, um, extraordinarily influenced by Godwin, which Michael can talk about better than I. Um, at the same time, his own sense of time has an eternal quality that isn't cloying mm -hmm. and that uh, isn't useful in a strange way. Excellent. Yeah, thank you for that. And I love how you how you foreground Shelley as a poet as well. Well, that's, I mean, that's how I see him. So <laughs> he, he's always a poet first for me, uh, despite the sort of lucidity and how, well, how wonderfully lucid compared to some of the poetry his prose works are. Hmm. Absolutely. Thank you for starting us off, Julie. Who would like to add to that? Um, I'll, I'll jump in. Um, so Julie, I, uh, what the first thing you said, uh, is something that really resonates for me and that's where I was going to go for someone who had, um, a, uh, who was very worried about his ability to speak to the people, um, and worried about, you know, am I only going to speak to a small number of people or an elite? He had, um, an uncanny knack for sloganeering. <laughs> and uh, quotable as you as you as you put it. So you know it starts with to me. And and by the way, I'm all that I'm going to be talking about today. It's not an, I'm not an academic, so I'm looking at this through the lens of how the public perceive him and why what what they do or don't think about him. But so there's a few very few poems which I think are responsible for this, and they're kind of the gateway drugs to Shelley. Um, and I think there's about five of them. So Mask of Anarchy. Rise like lions uh, after slumber. Ye are many, they are few. I met murder on the way. Uh, Ozymandias. Uh, my name is Ozymandias, king of kings. Uh, look on my works, ye mighty in despair. Uh, from defense of poetry, uh, poets are the unacknowledged legislators of the world. Ode to the west wind, if winter comes, can spring be far behind. And by the way, that's actually a revolutionary slogan, which has been seized upon by Hallmark and turned into the most anodyne of remarks. <laughs> but, but the working class certainly knew what the hell he meant. Yeah. Um, and then England 1819, where we've got an old, mad, blind, and dying king, mm -hmm. and rulers who neither see, nor feel, nor know. These are all 
great slogans. Um, he also had, so that's point one. Point two, um, he had a slew of very interesting supporters uh, and famous supporters like Robert Owen, Engels, Marx, Gandhi, Tagore, uh, Bakhtri, Shaw, James Connolly, Paul Foote. Um, so, you know, there's a lot of points that you can, that, that he radiates out to and you can follow your way in. He also had up his sleeve, one of the greatest editors of all time, um, his wife. Um, and then finally, I'd suggest that um, even a cursory look. So if you're if you, if you want to approach Shelley and you don't really know who he is, um, but, you, you know, he's very accessible um, despite all of the complex and difficult poetry, because you can you can access them through these other thinkers. You can access them through these short, pithy slogans. But also his biography reveals actually a phenomenally attractive set of attributes. So atheist, vegetarian, feminist, anti-authoritarian, philosophical anarchist, class traitor, and a traitor to the right class. Uh, he, uh, he, uh, he died young. Um, he was a radical agitator. In short, he was like a left-wing baller. And, uh, and on top of it all, he died young. So for young activists, um, this is a pretty appetizing menu. And I think all of these, these sort of piece, bits and pieces render him accessible and able to speak across centuries. I think... Thank you. I think what, what, um, what, what you asked why um, the, the poem appeals, it appeals because it's a great poem. I mean, it's got everything, music and rhythm and fantastic imagery. And besides, it tells us what we really need to hear when most people are divided um, by, you know, our work or... Um, people we, we have imposed on us artificial divisions like age and um, sex and so on. And this poem says to us, we are many. We are many. It tells us who our enemies are and it tells us who we've got to fight and how. Yeah, well, I love how you both spoke to this multi-generational appeal of Shelley as well, which I think is important. Perhaps we'll come back to that. Um, Michael, is there anything you'd like to add to this? Shelley's yeah, book? yeah the, the, all, all of the previous comments have been uh, you know, right on target. Um, I think one thing about Shelley, yeah, um, Graham mentioned that he, that he, that he, was, uh, he died before he was 30, um, which is blows my mind. I mean, that's just his accomplishments are just so numerous. And uh, in his short life, uh, you, you ask, you know, um, how, how he's a revolutionary voice, um, that he uh, uh, think of almost all of the institutions, the established institutions at his time, he opposed. So in religion, he, he writes uh, <laughs> the necessity of atheism and uh, ad addresses it to the uh, university authorities. And uh, so we know what happened with that. Um, so in religion and in terms of, uh, yeah, as, as Graham mentioned, his class, he, he rebelled against the aristocratic norms in a major way and his father would have uh, disinherited him if he could, but thanks to primogenitor, he couldn't. Um, and uh, in terms of uh, you know his first marriage went against the aristocratic norm. He married a you know middle class woman, and he also went against the marriage norms. He's um, and 
that part of Shelley, we, we might talk about. I, I, I think his, uh, it's in his poetry as well and in his life. I mean, I think from the perspective of today, I don't think he's that, uh, well, we have different standards now, but I don't think he's that admirable in his treatment of women, but that's another story. Maybe we can get to it. But um, he was a, uh, also, so he opposed the most powerful institutions, political, social, um, sexual, uh, religious, in addition to which he was a great poet. I mean, he was one of the greatest poets in English. And of the you know, so-called big six romantic poets, I think he was the most accomplished in terms of his artistry. I mean, some people might say Keats, but I, I, I think Shelley has a broader range. Um, but, and also he can do anything. I mean, he can write, uh, talk about accessibility. He, he can write uh, ballads, he can write uh, pamphlets, which he did. His, uh, um, his Irish servant spent six months in jail for <laughs> posting his, one of his pamphlets in Wales. Um, the contradictions of that are, well, they're pretty obvious. Um, but he could do that. And he also has a, um, a, a middle style of you know, say a letter to Mariah Gisborne that 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 might be uh, his middle style, and then he has his high style, and his high style is just magnificent. I mean, you know, the Prometheus Unbound is just uh, a fabulous uh, poem that uh, integrates so many different things. And I think what he, uh, uh, in terms of his ideological mix, is. He takes not just from Godwin, he also revises Godwin, um, and he adds other things. And he's, and the things that he adds are very cutting edge. In, in other words, he's, he's picking up on uh, currents in the radical movement of the time. Um, so he's influenced by the Spencians, for example. Um, he has connections with them. And uh, they were the most radical working class movement at, at the time. So uh, his ability to be receptive to these currents in a society and also international, he's a cosmopolitan. He's, he's um, paying attention to what's going on, not just in France, but everywhere. And he's, he's very tuned into it. So I think it's his, well, his, his artistry is just phenomenal. Um, and his ability to uh, capture the most uh, trenchant kind of critique that was available to him at, at that particular time. Um, so that's, um, that's, that's how he would see it. Oh, in addition to um, that, there's also an element that is, um, he's also in touch with, uh, as it was an important working class uh, element in radicalism at the time is uh, uh, religious messianic thought. Um, that was the Spencians for sure, and many others. I mean, this is, you know, you can think of Blake, Blake it's more explicit, but it's also an influence in, uh, and Shelley too. Excellent. Thank you for that. I think you mm -hmm. all spoke so wonderfully there to Shelley's receptivity, to the way he was so receptive to multiple audiences and ways of thought in his own time, and how that reception continues in our time through all different audiences, all mm -hmm. different streams. Yeah, that was an yeah. excellent way to start us off. Thank you for that. Okay. So we're going to move into individual questions for each of our speakers. Mm -hmm. uh, we'll do this alphabetically. So Julie, we'll start with you once more, if that's okay. Sure. So Shelley has had a tremendous influence upon real, real world revolutions through nonviolent protests and passive resistance, thinking particularly of his influence upon Gandhi. Mm -hmm. But passivity in action, violence and resistance are so frequently interposed in Shelley's poetry, 
for instance, mm -hmm. in the Mosque of Anarchy, although hope peacefully lays down on the path of violence, the speaker's call to rise like lions after slumber is not so passive. How does Shelley use violence in his poetry and what are his intended effects upon his audience? Well, I mean, I, I could talk about this all day, so I will restrain myself. And it's something that I've been thinking about a lot, um, particularly in terms of the Chenchi, but also in terms of the differences between his poetry and his prose, because in his prose, he's often extremely explicit and uh, not exactly shy about articulating things that are happening, things that could happen, um, the use of violent metaphors, if not the attraction of violent metaphors. But I would say that in, in terms of the question itself, when we think about violence in the poetry, the way I would frame that question is that for Shelley, I think the central concern is that violence and poetry are both ways and means to an end. And so you have, you have a nonviolent thinker or a person who at least largely wants to uphold nonviolence with some exceptions to the Greek revolution or otherwise. Um, but I conceive of him as somewhat aviolent because he really anticipates people like Hannah Arendt here in thinking about how violence itself doesn't really have an essence and it is both outside of language and inside of language, um, very similar to poetry. Poetry is what you do with it. And this is why we run into a lot of issues, fascinating issues, in terms of the defense of poetry, or even in a poem like the, Ma uh, the Mask of Anarchy of who is doing wh what to whom, and how, and to what end. So you brought up the notion that uh, hope lies peacefully down in the path of violence. She also wades through ankle deep in blood. And, uh, you know, Seth Marino brings this up, as well as Matt Barushko, but whose blood or how it got there, we really don't know. And you have a jump from stanza to stanza where suddenly anarchy is done. And the revolutionary violent moment is, well, it's not there, right? So we could say that, okay, it's a poetics of elision. He doesn't want to articulate violence because the articulation of violence itself is violent. He's anticipating questions of aestheticization that we deal with now. Um, I would say though that I am not quite sure about that because he is explicit in terms of how he talks about violence toward groups. Um, he is explicit in terms of how he uses metaphors, even drawing on people like Robespierre with the sword and lightning or in the Chenchi, which is, uh, which is my favorite. I talk to one of our audience members about this all the time, Omar Miranda, uh, where the, uh, pardon me, where one of the characters says that words are but as holy as the deeds they cover, which is effectively the same thing as covenants are as good as the sword that backs them, which is what Hobbes is talking about. Um, so the ordering of these things becomes very complicated. And the, issue of causality that I brought up earlier too also becomes complicated. So I think conceiving of how Shelley deals with violence toward individuals as opposed to leaping toward abstractions like high figurality uh, or dealing with allegory as, as we have the mask of anarchy that is itself a dream vision couched in what hope might or seems to say, right? She doesn't actually speak all of those things uh, at the end of the poem, her face radiates what she might have said. So again, you get the veil upon veil move, being at a remove. Um, in terms of uh, individualism though, I think that something like the Chenchi is a useful way of conceiving of the relationship between explicit, whatever, what you might consider explicit violence, articulatable violence, poetic violence, or what, and what poetry can do, because it is a poem that, or a, play that disgusted its reviewers despite nothing actually happening on stage at all. It says that he put the Shelley puts what is most horrible before our eyes, but nothing is actually put before our eyes. And so you, you wonder at what exactly it, were these people registering? And it's still a difficult play to read now. It's a particularly difficult play to teach at the same um, for uh, its, its topicality as well. Um, but He's also very interested in, especially with someone like Beatrice, in the pointlessness at times in narrating something, not so much in its inarticulability. Um, and 
once she is attacked by her father, when she's raped, she moves toward a more poetic framework, a more, speaking in metaphors, um, occupying the moment, saying that she doesn't know exactly what to think, but she knows that she has to act. And it is very much resembling the same kind of occupation of the present of being both the instrumental and the instrument, being the trumpet the le and the legislator, whatever it is that you're legislating, um, being both the sword and in the philosophical view of reform, the soldier as the knife, but it can cut both ways, uh, right? So this is why I think uh, the second part of the question in terms of concern with audience is very complicated because we hear in, about the relationship between, okay, you have popular verses like with the mask of anarchy, and then you have, uh, Graham brought this up before, something like Prometheus Unbound intended for um, higher minded audiences. It, as often linked to genre too, but um, so he's worried about these things because he knows, or he at least believes that audiences um, are a distillation of the society in which they live. And this is the problem with the French Revolution. This is why you have anxieties in his pamphlets written to Ireland about Ireland. He doesn't want the Irish Catholics to go wild with their anger because they haven't been sufficiently educated in how to manage the situation to actually foment progress. But in terms of a place like wanting to stage a play like this in Covent Garden, you have a whole range of people watching this of various class backgrounds. And the way he talks about it, the way he imagines how a domestic drama, how individuals actually, I think, probably more fully realized than many of his other poems can draw out uh, casuistry uh, can draw out trying to reason how Beatrice is both justified and faulty in her actions, even if they're wrong, is a fascinating and nuanced way of thinking about uh, the, the sort of multivalent way that both poetry and violence can enable thought, even if he is well aware that he's taking risks at all times as to what that thought might be. And I'd be happy to say more about this, but I'll, I'll cut myself off there. That was absolutely fascinating, Julie. Thank you so much. You've given me so much more to think about, especially the ways in which Shelley uses elision and how this is, could be tied up with violence or nonviolence as well. And your focus on his audiences as both readers and viewers, as in the case of the Chenchi, of, it, of how he intended it to be received, perhaps. Yeah, that was excellent. Thank you. Yeah, thank you so much, Julie. And thanks, Amanda. Um, I, I was also going to say about how uh, important I thought that point about audience was um, and I hope that might fuel some of our discussion as we continue. Um, and I think all the responses so far have spoken really to the range of Shelley and maybe what we might call his mature years or the Italian years in this variety of genres we've already had. Uh, 1819, The Mask of Anarchy, The Cenci, 1821, The Defense of Poetry. Uh, yeah, fantastic. Anyway, on to our um, next panelist. I'd like to ask Graham a question. Um, so along with inspiring modern revolutions and protests, Shelley's poetry has been an inspiration to modern musicians, uh, artists and filmmakers, particularly those with political agendas. What is it, Graham, about Shelley that connects revolution with pop culture, rock music and film? How do these various reinterpretations keep Shelley's revolutionary further alive. And also, could you tell us a little bit about your website and your social media, The Real Percy Bysshe Shelley, and how you hope to connect new audiences outside of academia, for example, with the poet and his work? Sure. Um, I just, all, before I started, I just want to reflect on a couple of things that uh, Julie said, um, or uh, that was in her question, and the, one of them was the reference to Gandhi. And look, mm -hmm. we, I think we know that there is a question, the extent to which or how Shelley's ideas did or didn't get to Gandhi. Um, I was doing an interview with an Italian filmmaker um, uh, and uh, Ulisse Leandra, uh, who had done a, a short uh, that was based on Ode to the West Wind. And uh, he, his um, producer uh, was Indian. And he was on the, on the, on the Zoom call with me and Ulisse and uh, towards the end, I asked him just, I said, you know, I'm interested in the, in, in Shelley's impact in, in India. And he said, oh my God, I mean, I could talk to you about that forever. Um, and it's not just that Gandhi may or may not have quoted the mask or anarchy or not, but um, you know, there were a couple of the most famous Indian poets and activists 
who were profoundly in influenced by Shelley. And one of them uh, was uh, Rabindranath Tagore, mm -hmm. and the other was Subramania Bharati, Bharati, who went so far at one point to actually start signing his poems, uh, Shelley de San, uh, which meant basically disciple of Shelley. Um, so there is a there is a really deep uh, um, well that I just I, I have searched and searched for um, uh, mainstream references to that and uh, and really haven't found much of it. Um, but back to, um, to to the question you asked me about, you know, what what is it? And again, I'm going to um, I'm, I'm going to look at how he was perceived. Uh, because I, I think we can, you know, argue about whether he was or wasn't an atheist, um, but it's how he was perceived by the left that matters, I think, in this regard. And so what I wanted to do was just sort of look at, rather than in my own words, look at how they perceived him. Like, what was it that resonated with the left that made him so important? And to me, one of the sort of most important documents in this regard is the speech that uh, Max Aveling and um, Eleanor Marx gave to the Shelley Society in, I think it was 1888. Hmm. Um, and I'll just give a couple of quotes here. She says, and he says, more than anything else that makes us claim Shelley as a socialist is his singular understanding of the facts that today, then, tyranny resolves itself into the tyranny of the possessing class over the producing class. And that to this tyranny in the ultimate analysis is traceable almost all evil and misery. She then goes on to say, and I think this is important, he saw that the so-called middle class, because we've talked about that a bit, is the real tyrant the real danger at the present day. Those of us who belong to that class in our delight at Shelley's fierce onslaughts upon the higher members of it, aristocrats, monarchs, landowners, are apt to forget that of us, he also speaks. Uh, and then finally, she compares him to Byron. <clears throat> so all of you Byronists, stop up your ears. It's not, oh. good. It's not good for, for George. Um, <laughs> She says a word upon Byron here. Shelley saw more clearly than Byron, who seems scarcely to have seen it at all, that the, and this is my favorite line, that the epic of the 19th century was to be the contest between the possessing and the producing classes. And it is just that that removes him from the category of utopian socialists and makes him so far as it was possible in his time a socialist of modern days. And that speech famously ends with the words, we claim him as a socialist. So I, I think you can, if you start to, that's a really, by the way, I, I'm gonna put in the, into the chat um, sources for this. My website actually has the only complete version of that speech that you can get online. And then if you flash forward uh, to modern times, um, you, you can find Paul Foote, who, uh, whose book Red Shelley came out in, in 1980, along with uh, um, a number of other companion books. One of them, Michael, was yours. Uh, these are book, his book, Dawson's book. These are books that were hugely influential to me because for me, Shelley is a sort of a political animal. Mm -hmm. But, um, you know, for, for Foote, it was that Shelley, for Shelley, he said, it, it wasn't enough to talk about the problem of exploitation and tyranny. He wanted to do something about it. And I think it's that action that sets him apart. And that's how they looked at him. Mm -hmm. Somebody who wanted to do something about it. Somebody who had a goddamn program. Um, and, you know, he, he and, and then he's for foot. Uh, he says that the thing about Shelley, and this goes to the poetry, you can't, you can't just look at Shelley as a poet, uh, sorry, as a political animal, which a lot of the Marxists did. You have to see him as a poet. What's important about his poetry? It's his enthusiasm. 
and he supplies the left with rhetoric, great slogans, great lines. Um, and uh, he says uh, here, for example, um, he says, uh, you begin to see his ideas, his enthusiasm and his love of life. He believed in life and he really felt uh, that life is what mattered, that life could and should be better than it is, could be better, should be better, could and should be changed. That was the thing he believed in most of all. So you read that. Now, of course, foot that comes from his speech to uh, the Marxist Con International Marxist Conference in, uh, in England in 1981, which I will say it took me 200 hours to transcribe. <laughs> and you can find it on the website. But now I want to flash forward to much more modern uh, um, folks. And it's, it's not just in film and television, although, and, and, and music, although it is liberally sprinkled throughout there. Um, I'm going to point to a young Irish Marxist poet who I, uh, I stumbled on through, uh, through my website, Kieran O'Rourke. I'll put in, uh, contact information for Kieran in, in the chat. Um, so here's what he thought mattered about Shelley. He says, there is something in the romanticism of Percy Shelley that seems always on the verge of breaking down the gateposts of history and gusting into our world. His work is subversive and multiplicitous, <laughs> often notable, not so much for its resemblance to that of his immediate fellows and forebearers than it is for its ease of access to revolutionary fervors past and future. Shelley prefigured radicals and listened to the crowd. That was written like a year ago. Another young um, writer that I've encountered is Paul Bond. He writes for the uh, Worldwide Socialist Web, which is a Trotskyite um, organ. And he wrote an article uh, for me in which he just started out and said, this is a revolutionary appraisal. Uh, and it is a tour de force, I think, of the reception that Shelley got on the left. So I, I'll put that article into the, uh, into the chat, have a read of it because it really um, you know, traces all of the important things that mattered to them. And you know, he, he, um, he felt that you know, the poet, he, he felt that Shelley found his champions in the working class um, and spent a lot of time talking about Engels and Frost, uh, who uh, were writers in the Northern Star, the, uh, the uh, organ of the, uh, the Chartists. Um, so that's, you know, I would say those are things that, that kind of show you what appealed to folks on the left. Um, now, uh, if I may then answer this, the second part, Anna, of the question, um, my website. <laughs> Uh, so I started a website about five or six years ago, um, which I refer to as the home of the real Percy Bysshe Shelley, uh, and uh, it's a marketing thing. Um, I'm, there are lots of other real Percy Bysshe Shelleys, um, but in any event, the, the goal of that site is to provide access to people outside of the uh, halls of academe. Uh, and to find those people who may have encountered him as a high school student, and it was only that they just happened to like one or other of his poems. I want to find those people, and I want to bring them back to him. I also want to find people like Kieran, right? Like Paul Bond, like uh, uh, the filmmaker, right? Uh, like Ulysses. I want to find those people, and I want to give them a voice. Um, and and uh, to to connect Shelley's radical ideas to a modern reading public, um, so the the website itself was I think ahead of its time, uh, in that um, you know now more and more people are doing this. But one of the secrets to its success was it had a social media amplification arm. So there was an associated Facebook page, Twitter page, Instagram page. Um, now the Keith Shelley Association is doing that. Lots of people are doing that. 
but then that was really, really uncommon. And um, the, you know, the facts are that it got a really big audience. Um, you know, it's not, you know, at the, at the time, my Twitter followers are dwarfed now, Anna, by uh, the, the great work that you and your, your team have done. But I still have, for somebody who just does this on his own, his part time, I have 1,700 followers there. And on Facebook, um, that's where the real success has lain in terms of reaching people. So I've, um, let me give you an example, a recent article by my young friend, Oliver Ramirez, who I see is here today. Hi, Oliver, uh, high school student in the United States of America, beautiful writer, another sort of person that I'm reaching out to, to try to find, to give an opportunity to speak. Well, I, so I put, a, I put up an article of his and um, that reached over 7,000 people. It had almost 500 reactions. 22 comments and 42 shares. Like that's just one article by, um, I think he just turned 17 if I'm not wrong. Um, but anyway, uh, and that's very typical. So I can reach that audience. I've got about 3,700 active followers around the world. Biggest audiences being in Italy, uh, the United States, uh, England, uh, and now India. Um, now my website, I've got a, a Squarespace website. So I've got tons of analytics. I've had about 100,000 page views since inception uh, and 52,000 unique visitors. Um, and that's a lot for an academic website that focuses on a poet who was dead 200 years ago. Uh -huh. This week alone, I've had 12,000 uh, page views and 9,000 unique visitors. So that's, what I do in my spare time. I have a full-time job and I wish I could do more. Um, what is holding me back is I need, and I had a great research assistant uh, like the Keats Shelley Association has, Anna. Uh, I need, if anybody out there, uh, I will pay the same, same rate as Keats Shelley, but I need somebody to help me um, source material and uh, edit and, uh, and, and also develop content. So I hope that answered your questions. Thanks so much, Graham. And you can look into the chat now. You've uh, finished speaking and see that you've got plenty of people asking for you to give directly <laughs> all the things you reference. So that that's really fantastic. Um, uh, I've had a direct message also just asking about uh, the audience questions uh, just after 8 p.m. BST. Uh, we will come to your questions in the chat. So do feel free to use that forum to uh, put your thoughts and questions in there. I'm going to move on to uh, Jackie now, um, Jacqueline Van Halen, um, and we're going to ask you a question also thinking about Shelley and social change, of course. So your book, uh, Percy Bysshe Shelley, Poet and Revolutionary, is perceptively attuned to the periods of reform and revolution that really influenced Shelley's life and writings. Although Shelley was destined to inherit his father's seat as a Whig MP, he turned instead towards the vocation of a poet or an unacknowledged legislator. How has Shelley's poetry enacted its own form of social change and progress in his own time and ours? Over to you, Jackie. Well, first of all, um, it, it wasn't a question of choosing between becoming a poet and becoming a Whig MP. When Shelley was in the bosom of his family destined to be uh, inherit his father's seat, he was writing poetry then, he was a poet already, and he probably would have persisted in that whatever he'd done. The reason he didn't become a Whig MP, I think everybody knows, he was expelled from Oxford for writing The Necessity of Atheism. The, um, the other thing, is that um, an unacknowledged legislator, a, a poet, I'm not quite sure what you mean in this context, but perhaps it could be said that the, the um, somebody who engages in social movements and brings about so, social change as a, as a legislator of sorts, um, rather than somebody who actually enacts laws in the House of Commons or, you know, in a court of some kind. Um, the thing with 
the thing about the um, po poems which probably influenced people the most, um, in his own lifetime and in, in the 19th century, definitely Queen Mab was exceedingly popular. It was known as the Chartist Bible. And um, it was actually published in his lifetime um, and reached a, a fairly wide audience because it was pirated. So a lot of people would have known um, his ideas from Queen Mab, although it's not so, um, so much read today. And of course that did have a big influence on 19th century thinking. Um, there were big changes um, in um, attitudes towards atheism and attitudes towards marriage and um, the early, um, I think you could call them feminists in the 19th century, Anna Wheeler, Harriet Taylor, they quoted from the revolt of Islam, can man be free if woman be a slave? And it was a big influence on, on those 19th century feminists. And in, um, the in the 20th century, when the suffragettes campaign started, they it, the suffragettes were extremely um, fond of Shelley. So he had a big influence on um, women at, at, at that time. In fact, deeds not words was the suffragette slogan, and it came from um, Mask of Anarchy, of course. Um, Shelley also had an effect on, um, f through Queen Mab, I think on, on um, you know, Graham mentioned Gandhi. Um, uh, there was some, um, there were people becoming vegetarians in the late, Shaw became a vegetarian because, <laughs> because of Shelley. And um, that again is something that's much increased nowadays too. But I think that, also, um, what might have influenced people would have been Episcopalian. Um, we know that Forster quoted from Episcopalian. Um, Thomas Hardy was very um, influenced by Shelley and he produced some um, novels that were very against the oppression of women. But I think with, I think what's really um, more important is that Shelley does have an influence, uh, that did have an influence on those groups of people, but he's more importantly a revolutionary poet. And as we started off by saying, The Mask of Anarchy is a fantastic poem and has inspired many, many people. I mean, you mentioned one or two, I could think of Occupy, the poll tax. Um, Jeremy Corbyn was reading it at Glastonbury a few years ago. It um, took on the, the um, Labour Party slogan, we are many, um, came from that. So, but I think rise like lands and after slumber in an unvanquishable number that really speaks to people who want to be, uh, who want to recognize their strength and want to recognize that their strength is in numbers and not, and not be divided. Thank you so much, Jackie. And I'm going to hand over to Amanda now, who's going to ask I, my could I just, question. But could sorry, I, Graham, just to say before we do go to questions from the audience, but Graham, go ahead. I, I just wanted to uh, react to something Jacqueline said um, and also point out that on my website, uh, I've also published Jacqueline um, and uh, talked about her book and your article about um, that you wrote for me on the politics of revolutionary politics of Shelley to this day is the number one uh, sourced uh, article on my site. 
oh, by, okay. a, by a long shot. <laughs> so the, the other thing I just wanted to comment about is this issue of the legislator, because um, I think I think that Shelley was using, at least this is my understanding, was that Shelley was using that in, in, a, in, a, in a different sense, right? So not as the uh, as we would today as a lawmaker or the French philosophes would, right? It's not a lawmaker. It's as a representative of the people. Yes. And, and I think that that's why um, today cre young creative people um, like Ariel Cottingham, who's a slam poet, um, when you look at what they're doing and what they're saying, they see themselves as the voice of the people, right? Um, and uh, I don't think Shelley ever... Uh, saw uh, poets as imposing a set of rules on society. Rather, um, the, the influence they possess is, is, is sort of based on the fact that they represent uh, the people and can prefigure where public opinion is going. That's what makes them legislators. And I think we can abandon the unacknowledged part. He's really just saying they are legislators um, and I think that's the source. And I think that's why they're so dangerous. When authoritarians get into power, the first people they go after are often the creators. They stick them in prison, then the journalists, or maybe at the same time. But they're a tremendous threat to authoritarians for that reason. I think that's what he meant by legislator. Oh, yes. Mm. Yes, I, I agree with you, Graham. Sorry, I didn't make that clear. So thank you for that. We have a question from Michael, and then we're going to go straight to audience questions after this. So Michael, yes. Shelley's radicalism was not without precedent. As your crucial study, Radical Shelley, the Philosophical Anarchism and Utopian Thought of Percy to Shelley makes clear. How did Shelley's radicalism develop out of and improve upon the influential works of William Godwin, Mary Wollstonecraft, Thomas Paine, and others? And what did Shelley take from these critical thinkers and what is unique about Shelley's radicalism? It's a, uh, um, the proper answer to that would take a really long time to it. <laughs> but um, Godwin's uh, philosophical anarchism, um, inquiry into political justice and other works provided Shelley with a critique of society, critique of authoritarianism, and, um, and a sketching out a kind of ideal society that would be as egalitarian as Godwin could imagine. Or I would rephrase it a bit as the enlightenment thinkers could, could imagine. And the thing about Godwin is that he he is extreme. I mean, you know, and there are parts of the inquiry into political justice that are, you know, I mean, they're they're really uh, out, kind of outrageous. Um, Shelley wouldn't pick up that, it, and an aspect of Godwin that he definitely did not take up, though, was Godwin's. Um, hyper individualism. Um, the, the, the Godwin also did not, even though Godwin himself was extremely sociable, um, that he did not believe in political or organizations um, being activists. So the London Corresponding Society, even though he knew tons of people in it and was friends with them, he, he, he really didn't go for the London Corresponding Society, because it was a group, and he felt that they had dangerous authoritarian uh, tendencies. Well, Shelley doesn't take that. I mean, Shelley is okay with groups, and he, um, as is clear in his activities in Ireland, he tried to form a, you know, a, a political group, kind of quasi, uh, I don't know, if, it's anachronistic, but it's almost like a Leninist group of, of uh, intellectual leaders. Um, so, uh, and another thing about uh, about uh, uh, difference with with Godwin is that well, I don't know if it's a difference, but Shelley was very pragmatic. 
um, she, uh, Shelley had a sense of what was possible and what was not possible. And that's clear in the Hermit of Marlowe pamphlets. Um, there, that's uh, at a very tumultuous time. He, he comes up with very practical uh, steps to take. Um, it's not uh, anarchy, but it's moving toward his his ideal. But other influences, which I talked about, is his receptivity. I mean, he was absorbing, I mean, his sources include classical uh, thinkers. I mean, Plato, and um, I'm trying to think of some others. Uh, uh, but oh, let me see this now. Uh, oh, yeah. Diogenes. He, he really had a thing for Diogenes. And, and so, but the Greek and Latin um, philosophers and, and, and thinkers, he was very much into them and also was reading them in a particular way to take out the most radical aspects. And so that's part of his synthesis. And that's another aspect of, of, of Shelley is that he was an incredible reader that he uh, you know knew what almost a ten, a ten different languages and um, that he just had this fierce intellectual curiosity, fantastic memory, and so he's you know just absorbing as much as he possibly can. So, so it's not just Godwin, and you know it, and with pain too. It's, you know, he takes. Um, a particular style, you can see the pain influence with the Welsh uh, pamphlets um, that's very much in the pain style of uh, writing a manifesto and you know, <laughs> uh, putting it on one sheet and a broadside and um, uh, nailing it to a tree and, <laughs> and hoping that uh, the working class is going to be reading it. Um, let's see. And um, also uh, Wollstonecraft. I mean, clearly Wollstonecraft was a huge influence. Also that um, Mary Shelley and, um, and Percy read and reread and thought about and mm -hmm. uh, absorbed and everything. Um, Mary, Mary Wollstonecraft. Mary Wollstonecraft was um, one of his intellectual mentors, and, and it, was, it wasn't just God. I mean, I, I keep saying this wasn't because my my book of 1982 really emphasized Godwin. So I say, well, you know, there's all this other stuff too. Um, and uh, also his receptivity to what's going on in in the French Revolution. I mean, one of the um, interesting things that um, uh, that that Julie brought out was um, the whole business about violence. And um, he really thought long and hard about that. But that was something that was a product of the French Revolution, French terror, that uh, a lot of a lot of thinkers and radicals and liberals after or you know, after the 1790s were extremely troubled by that. And they had to make some kind of sense of it. And that's what Shelley's doing. I mean, that's, um, you know, I, I can think of other examples about the violence. It's um, in Prometheus Unbound. It's Demogorgon who does the dirty work of, you know, taking Jupiter down in, into the underworld. It's no, we don't see the, uh, the actual force exerted um, and then we have a, a kind of comic uh, violent scene in Swellfoot the Tyrant, which uh, uh, Jackie has Jackie has written about so uh, so well. Um, and a lot of people don't know Swellfoot the Tyrant, and it's a delightful, uh, delightful text. Um, it requires footnotes, but you know, <laughs> what can I say? It's a it's, it's a great satirical uh, text. Um, and he's also in, uh, he's bouncing off of Byron and also, I mean, they were very good friends and true enough, he wasn't 
the kind of the sort of revolutionary that that Shelley was. He was more, it was a different kind. Um, but uh, the dialogue that the two had that went on for many years was, you know, until Shelley died, was very fruitful and it helped clarify what um, what Shelley's radicalism was all about. You know, he could say, well, Byron thinks this, but I'm thinking mm -hmm. that. I mean, Julian and Modelo would be a good example of that. But, you know, there's, there's also um, other texts that uh, show the symptoms of the Byron-Shelley dialogue. Um, let's see, anything else? Oh yeah, Rousseau, obviously a huge, Influence. I mean, in the Triumph of Life, it's it's Rousseau and Rousseau at the time. Um, he was the you know pioneer of Romanticism, but he was also considered the father of the French Revolution. I mean, Robespierre, you know, thought thought the very highest of Rousseau and um, celebrated him and uh, and as as a replacement for Christianity was. <laughs> Uh, uh, not worshiping, but um, acknowledging the centrality of of Rousseau. So, and, and unique, um, what is unique about him? I think it's that he's able to be a visionary and um, articulate poems at a very high level formally. All kinds of allegorical fireworks going on, and uh, engaging myths and turning them upside down, and just you know all that kind of stuff. But also, he could speak uh, plainly, and as he does, uh, one poem that I think is a beautiful example is this, England, uh, eighteen nineteen, you know, the mad, blind, despised, and dying king. I and mean, it's a great. I, I I would have my students read it out loud, and they say, "Be angry." Be angry. This is a poem of anger, and uh, but it's and I, I think it's that in emotional intensity uh, that comes through, and it comes through in all his styles, you know, high, middle, low, and uh, but he was able to, and even the things that are so-called popular. He makes so complicated. I mean, if you really look into it, I mean, you know, Mask of Anarchy is, you know, it's a, it's a dream allegory. There are all kinds of ambiguous things in it. And the same thing with, with that sonnet, with the mad blind, I mean, the, the way it is a, um, you know, of the final two lines are may burst. I mean, it's not will burst or are burst, it's may burst. It's, he always adds that little, something that um, stopped you short and say, oh, I see. And, and then you have to, you can't be simply carried away. Okay, that's, I know that people have uh, things to say. Yeah, so. that, was absolute, that was excellent, Michael. Thank you so much. Sure. So looking at the time, I think we're going to go straight into our audience Q&A. So I'll hand over to Anna to chair this bit. Yes. and. Um, we have already had a lot of questions. So uh, I, what I thought I would do here is to say that from the audience, I can see that perhaps what everyone is most interested in now, potentially I'm just scanning through the questions and I'm sure uh, the speakers have had time maybe to read through those too, is Shelley as he exists after his death. So Shelley and legacy, um, his influence on other poets, um, Shelley as he is depicted in film, um, Shelley as his relevance to politics today, that kind of thing. So I'm going to start with that as a kind of uh, throw-up question. And I know Graham did have his hand up. So Graham, would you like to say what you were going to say anyway? And then we'll kind of uh, begin our discussion on Shelley's legacy. Well, I was just going to reflect on something that Michael said, which I think is interesting. And it's the relationship between Byron and, and, uh, and Shelley. There's a lot of uh, ink spilled on uh, Byron's effect on Shelley, maybe less on Shelley's effect on Byron. Um, and there's a really excellent book by uh, one of England, well, one of the world's top scholars on Greece, uh, Roderick Beaton. Uh, and I think it's called By uh, Byron's Greece. Uh, he's since written a, a, a book about the history of modern Greece. 
But in that book, he, he talks about the effect that Shelley's death had on Byron and how suddenly it's like, okay, I'm going to Greece. Um, and it was almost as if he saw in Shelley someone that he could have been, you know, because Shelley was a skeptic. Byron, the way I think of it, Shelley's a skeptic. Byron's a cynic. And, there, and, and you cannot be a revolutionary if you're a cynic. That's something that Foot, uh, a comment that Foot makes about uh, about the two of them, um, mm-hmm. and uh, ultimately he gets to Greece and becomes disillusioned. And at some point, and I cannot find the source for this quote, but at some point he says, in somewhat disgust, "Oh God, what am I doing here? This is Shelley's war." So I just that, that, I just wanted to reflect on that from Michael. Well, I I would I mean I. Uh, the qu- questions of reception are, are essential, I think, and have been coming up repeatedly uh, throughout here. But I would question calling Byron just a cynic. And maybe I'm, I'm not I'm not a Byronist and I don't want to speak on behalf of all of the Byron people who would uh, know better than I on this. But I think that he is much he's a satirist and a preeminent satirist. And there's a strong difference. And I mean, his love lyrics events is totally alternative side of him, as well as his letters, as well as his journals, as well as his own, uh, his own instabilities that, I mean, Shelley as having a sort of delicate constitution himself also shared, which I think partly is why uh, they're, they're interesting together. And um, I believe Michael brought up Julian Modelo. The, the relationship is interesting to me because I think that Byron had the capacity to occupy a position to actually talk to Shelley. We have lots of accounts of Shelley as sort of holding court. Uh, it's famously, you know, John Keats, like the poet Shelley was present, you know, sort of in a flat way, expounding upon the virtues of the natural diet. And it's, uh, and you kind of get a sense of, okay, maybe maybe not the best uh, conversationalist, but in sense of Julie Medall, as I recall, um, you have Byron, the figure of Byron, sort of taking the opposite position as Julian, Mm-hmm. for the sake of argument, right? Of, because he, of out of pride or something along those lines, he could rise to the occasion. And perhaps without that, to your point, without that counterpart, you get um, a sort of strongly enervating effect. I mean, the whole circle dissolves as well. Mm-hmm. But um, I, I, I just, I don't want to use Byron as a straw man there. I had, I had to have my, put something in. Yeah. yeah, I, I, I agree with that, that um, uh, th- there's, a book I really like about the Byron Shelley relationship. It's uh, Charles Robinson. That, um, mm. Oh forget. yeah, that's great. Yeah, mm-hmm. that's. Um, but I guess I would just say, but but, but, but there is. I mean, um, yeah, he shows even in poems that don't look like um, Shelley has influenced it, but he shows, yeah, that he shows that their works are in dialogue. That they're, you know, Shelley says this, Byron absorbs it's ll i say that and so on is that the I mean, eagle a, the eagle good, and wreath yeah, in, that's it yeah yeah yeah, yeah. yeah that's uh, but i i think i was just going to say julia that um regardless of whether they were or weren't i i guess my point was like he's con- they constant like eleanor marx she she starts with that that's the distinction right mm-hmm. they see they, that's how they perceive them rightly or wrongly i think on the left they felt that Shelley's a kindred spirit. He's one of us. He's 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 part of the class struggle. That other guy, no. Well, he's a lord, right? So you already he's and, already and never, <laughs> and never. I st- still to this day, I, I feel in solidarity. I have to start with my left wing friends. I have to just call him George. <laughs> I'm not giving him the lord anymore. He's George. <laughs> um, Baron did fight with the Carbonari. Hmm. He did. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Yeah, he was. Uh, so he yeah. was revolutionary. Yeah, he he was. Was revolutionary. Absolutely. Um, I mean, it's 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 a particular type, you know, the aristocratic uh, rebel. Yes, exactly. Um, yes. I, yeah, I mean that's I mean, that's a figure. I mean, you know, in in Ireland too. I mean, you have figures like that. That you know, I mean, true enough. You know, they're not working class, but. Well, I wonder I mean, if. I, I, Oh, yeah. sorry. No, sorry. I mean, I was wondering if like perhaps um, one of Byron's great interventions is this is his level of self-awareness as a celebrity 
and a way of talking on three different levels at any given time, uh, hyper of both caricaturing himself, uh, speaking plainly, also anticipating audience concerns. Um, but I mean, one of, you know, why Shelley, we've been talking about this again and again, is that he's constructed retroactively. Some of the poems that we're talking about as his great successes, Anarchy, England in 1819, are all published posthumously. Mm -hmm. um, right. Are all either for often framed by Mary Shelley or um, yeah. or others. We're getting Thomas Jefferson Hogg's Je uh, Shelley at Oxford, which is where we're getting a lot of his interest in science, a sort of maniacal second chapter there. Um, I mean, his his capacity to contain such multitudes in a way allow you to pick and choose in, mm -hmm. in certain. And Keats has this problem too, because it is a it is somewhat of a problem, even if he, Shelley, is useful to us. I'm always a little bit nervous about thinking about the utility of mm. his poetry. Um, yeah. do, um, I don't, but I'll just pause there. Yeah. yeah By I, the way, I, speaking of Keats, I, I just would say yeah. that, you know, as a, as a board member of the Keats Shelley Association, to this day, I don't know why, I do not know why it's not the Byron Shelley Association. Sorry. Yeah. Oh. <laughs> I have no view but, on that. No. Byron has its has his own association. I know he does. I know he does. Amanda and I debated Keats versus Shelley recently for Keats House Museum, and uh, let's not do that right now. Let's get back to <laughs> Shelley himself. Let's stick with Shelley. <laughs> uh, so yeah, I wanted to, uh, I suppose, uh, again, bringing uh, those kind of comments in the chat all together as people who work on Shelley, people who want other people to read Shelley more. To what extent do you think it all matters when we think about the revolutionary Shelley and the um, depictions of him, either in kind of Victorian criticism, somewhat mentioned Matthew Arnold, the depictions mm. of him on film, uh, the depictions of him, um, or even just the use of his words in political slogans, which has come up. I think that's something that's been running through all the comments so far. So I wonder if the panel had any more thoughts on that. Yeah. Well, you know, from the point of view of popular, uh, you know, culture, I think the modern uh, cinema has done the entire circle a vast disservice. Yeah. Um, and uh, the the problem that we have in in the general public, I've written about this, um, is that you take Haifa Al Mansour's movie, like it's just made up. And, yeah. and the screenwriter admits it, that she just reached a point, well, what the hell? Um, uh, you can only research so much, so we're just going to go with this. And so masses of people have a perception, and you, you, can, you, you can see it online, uh, you can see it in, in, in conversations, you mention it, and then you start to get back this odd image of Shelley and or Byron or whatever, and you go, oh, I know. Where, did you see that movie? Yes. yes. I saw that movie and it's like, oh, for love of God. So I, I think that's, um, that presents a problem for reception in the modern age, but. Um... Absolutely, I, I agree those movies are <laughs> very influential. You keep coming up against these weird ideas. <laughs> yeah, I mean, you got, like, and, and it gives you the impression that Mary, and, and it does Mary a disservice too, because it gives you the impression she wrote all 60,000 words of Frankenstein in one frenzy in a night. Like, no, it was like actually super hard. It's not easy. And this is the problem that, you know, we have a lot of public perception. I'm, you know, I'm married to a recording artist. I can tell you like art takes time. And Shelley in particular, think about how he, labored over his poems and sometimes yes you know he tossed a couple off but generally speaking art is freaking hard and yet public perceptions of it is it's like ah oh, it's pretty easy i just dashed off frankenstein in a night yeah well i i think um my takeaway with the different movies and a, a couple i like i like uh jane campion's um one on keats I yeah mean, I, I know a lot of people hate it, but mm. I like it. Real tearjerker, but no, <laughs> nothing wrong with that. Oh, right. um, but anyway, I, I, I think when you have movies about, you know, the, uh, you know, Shelley or, or Byron or Mary or 
or, or Keats. One thing I like about it is even if they mess up the historical details, uh, which inevitably they do, but they keep those names in circulation. And hopefully some people will actually pick up a book and, and read it and, uh, you know, read, read Shelley. And uh, I, I think that's, to me, that's far more valuable than whether or not a film gets it right. I mean, I don't think a film is going to get it right, but um, as long as as long as there's sparks and interest, I mean, you know, I'm putting the bar low, but you know, that, that's the way I see it. Well, I mean, part of the issue too with, with any kind of these productions and uh, is that Shelley's biography is very complicated and often goes against uh, any kind of idealism that we can import. And so this came up a little bit before I saw in the chat in terms of his treatment of women, oh. of sort of, uh, well, I, I like you until I don't. And then you know, sayonara, that kind of thing with the, the tr treatment of um of Harriet West, Harriet Westbrook. There are a lot of Harriet yeah. mixed up. Yeah. Um, that's, that's and it's, it, sorry. I, I said it was, his treatment was pretty terrible of her. Yeah. Uh, yeah, I mean, and part of this too is, so this is the thing about, I think that's interesting about conceiving of Shelley in a contemporary sense, or even when you get to the 1880s, when you start seeing him picked up by Fabian socialists or otherwise, is that, um, you know, Shelley in his, own time, it's difficult. There's a retroactive projection of, of different kinds of moralistic thinking of whether he should or should not have been involved with some woman, the, the, the affair uh, with Shelley's charge in Italy, um, any number of, of problematic interventions of Claire Claremont, who knows what's going on there. Mm -hmm. um, but at the same time, you know, this, this is sort of also the stuff of what would make for an interesting film. And I, I wonder if his imbrication with the Gothic um, by ver by way of Mary, but also himself being interested in these topics is also part of why some of the representations of him are so bizarrely distorted, even though they need not be, given how crazy his life was. Uh, it just strikes me as like, it should be easy to write this if you wanted to actually have some kind of biopic or what have you. But, um, I, but I, think they had their own, I think some of the filmmakers had their own agendas, messages that they were trying to deliver. But, you know, I, the other thing I think, you know, we, we can remember uh, is that as far as I can tell, and correct me if I'm wrong, academics, um, the agents of revolutionary change in his poetry are almost all women or female characters, almost every one of them, whether it's Queen Mab, Prometheus Unbound, all of them. And uh, certainly for Eleanor Marx at a very different time uh, with very different, um, I guess, you know, whatever, uh, biographies to go on, uh, embrace that. Th that's why he got the reputation of being a feminist, was that how he wrote about women. Then we can look into his personal biography and find some very disturbing um, behavior, which, you know, cannot be forgiven and should not be condoned. Um, but uh, unfortunately, you often find it becoming caricatured, um, again, in, in, in pop culture. Mm -hmm. um, just on, on, well, departing from that note, I realize we have just under 10 minutes left. Mm. So I wonder if I could ask each of the speech speakers in maybe one or two minutes to describe which of Shelley's works are most deserving of the label revolutionary. Uh, which works? I'm sorry. Yes, so we, we've gone through Swellfoot, we've gone through Mask of Anarchy, Julian and Madelo. Which, if you have to choose one, which one is Shelley's most revolutionary work? It's an impossible question. Right. It's impossible. The question is which one isn't in a certain way, right? Yeah. Um, poems or prose? Either, either one. Right. See, I, gonna I, go first. I, I, think, I, I agree with Julie. I like it. almost which one isn't. And he, I, you could say, well, you know, some of the love poetry. Um, maybe that wasn't. But no, his approach to love 
at his time was actually revolutionary. Like when you, when you, when he talks about love, he, he is actually, um, and you can find it every, he's talking about empathy. Mm -hmm. It is right about sexual love. Of course he does, but really it's way that this whole of putting, taking yourself out of yourself and putting yourself in the position of the other. Um, it's, you, you might say he's not a love poet. He's an empathy poet. And that was pretty revolutionary. Well, and that's what he says about poetry itself is in terms of framing things in terms of empathy frequently um, mm -hmm. as a mode of expanding one's circumference, a favorite word of his as well. Mm -hmm. um, I would say I'm going to I would say if for a poem that basically takes that draws together a lot of what makes, I think, a lot of his poetry so fantastic in terms of constantly trying to manage that which is unmanageable, that also has the kinds of violent representations of landscape, the idea of vacancy and chasms, could be a uh, Mont Blanc, which I consider to be, you know, last year's is most, probably most as important first poem, but Mont Blanc, I think, is probably, for me, where he's really coming into his own. Um, so it's a revolution for his thought, in addition to him being able to capture some of his um, stated aspirations for poetry, which is not necessarily to go all in and do something completely new so much as to pick the best possible forms upon which to draw in order to cap in order to channel something else to reflect but maybe not be totally reflexive um and i mean he, he says which is which is he's which bill keach has written about ex extensively in terms of its debts to lycidas and coleridge um mm -hmm. as well but i mean but clearly doing something entirely new um clearly capturing all of his concerns with you know philosopher atheist and i always forget the the first one or the third one um <laughs> someone can help me there in terms of him signing the book as he does this all this right democrat democrat, the democrat yeah, supposed uh democrat. landscape and also asserting this question uh notion of uh large codes of fraud and woe without the allegory and where the mountain will not be allegorized. And so he is challenging himself in a tremendous way, uh, which for me is why it's, I think, perfect in a lot of ways. Yeah, so that's, a, uh, that's an interesting uh, example. Um, to me, the most revolutionary is Prometheus Unbound. And it's because it's, um, it is so, it's uh, complete complex. Revolution, isn't it, it? It does. It does so. I mean, it enga it's revolutionary in the sense that it's engaging key concepts and myths of Western culture, and yeah. revealing the authoritarianism here, there, and everywhere, and showing how these um, these are interconnected and parallel, and you know, there's a philosophy of history in there um that's uh, and just the poet and the poetry itself mm -hmm. is astonishing i mean I just, yes. and and i and i think it um it's articulating the implications of a poem like mask of anarchy just much much in a much richer mm. form of expression and uh and and it's also a I think that's the poem. I mean, you know, the uh, there's the expression in uh, in sports in the U.S. anyway of people say, you know, I left it out. Uh, I left left it all out on the field. In other words, <laughs> I exerted myself as much as I possibly could. And I think that's with Ferdinand really Sundbaum. I mean, he he, you know, let everything out. Um, you know, he let his he didn't worry so much about whether it was going to be liked or not liked or anything. He just blocked that out of his mind. And he says, you know, maybe five or six people will, <laughs> will read this, but um, I think he could have been exaggerating nevertheless. I, um, so, so that's why, even though, I mean, it's an elite poem. I mean, yeah. it seems to me that to, to be able to read it, you have to have a certain level of literary education or gobbledygook. Um, but, anyway. but it's so lovely you can join it, it you can enjoy it anyway you don't have to get all the references no true it's enough beautiful to to read and yeah it is 
I, I, I think I'd go, go with you with that one. Huh? Well, but okay. actually, I do have another one, huh? <laughs> which is Charles the First. Mm. Oh yeah, and Charles the First is was not finished, of course. But okay. you know, if it had been, it would have been the most stupendous drama in our in our yeah. repertoire. I think it was just very, very great. Um, you know, great characters, a great character drawing, wonderful poetry, wonderful. Um, idiolect for each each sort of person that's talking in the play um and you know it's exciting very exciting to watch it would have been mm -hmm. but you know he didn't finish it he died nora isn't charles the first in your volume seven yeah that's right yeah yeah and i and i think <laughs> And, and I, I think, so Jacqueline, I'm gonna, I, I think until I read what Nora and Neil were doing with Charles I, um, it was a poem that was a bit of a mystery to me, but I, I certainly am looking at it very differently now. Um, I, I would say if I had to pick up, and by the way, amazing, I've got it, Nora, just incredible. <laughs> the, whole world, the whole world thanks you. I have a copy too. <laughs> But um, I, I would say, you know, one way to look at the answer to the question is, which is the most revolutionary poem? Okay, so which is the most likely to have or has had the most revolutionary impact? Mm -hmm. And that's Mask of Anarchy. Mm -hmm. And Ozymandias, which I think- Everybody I, knows. That's to me the gateway drug. If I was gonna give a single poem to somebody I wanted to interest Shelley in Shelley, I would do, I would give it that because it, it, give them that because it is such a concentrated distillation of so much of his revolutionary agenda. But otherwise I would pick Prometheus Unbound. Excellent, thank you. The poem everybody knows, everybody immediately mm. comes up with when they think mm. of Shelley. Mm -hmm. I think they must have it on the school curriculum somewhere. Yeah. Well, I mean, it's, uh, it's, it, if you look at uh, just, um, you know, those poetry competitions that take place all over the United States, high schools, right? The, they, there are, I forget what it's called in the U.S., but there's these, these poetry competitions and uh, they start at, at the state level and then they work up to national finals where people recite poems over and over and over again. It's two of them that you keep seeing from these young high school voices. Ozymandias, England in 1819. So interesting. Thank you. Um, yeah, thank you. Thank you, everyone. Uh, we have come to the end of our allotted time. So although there, there is so much more to say, and I'm enjoying the debate between which poetry, uh, which poem we should uh, kind of hold up as the revolutionary poem here. Um, that was a wonderful way to bring it back, Amanda and panelists, to... Shelley's original words away from the kind of legacy stuff and back to what Shelley actually wrote down. And I think that was really important. So a great way to end. Um, I'm just gonna say, if you don't already, please do look at our website, um, um, which I've put in the chat and we'll go in the um, text under this video online. Please do follow us on Twitter and look out for more events like this. They will happen ahead of the conference on the bicentenary of Shelley's death in 2022. That is the end of the formal event. We are going to stay around to chat with people for maybe 15 minutes or so. Um, I wanna give a special thanks to Amanda Blake Davis who has been uh, the center of this wonderful event. So all big thanks should go to her. She's been a wonderful host and chair. And then of course, huge thanks to all of our speakers, um, Judy Camarada, Jacqueline Milhallen, Graham Henderson and Michael Schreibner. Thank you.